This is the Rex pop-up call on Wednesday, January 16th, 2019 with Sarah Salty about creativity and reframing creativity. And uh, a poem I've picked to take us into the call is uh, by Billy Collins, who is a funny poet, uh, and it's titled The Afterlife and goes as follows. While you are preparing for sleep, brushing your teeth or riffing through a magazine in bed, the dead of the day are setting out on their journey. They are moving off in all imaginable directions, each according to his own private belief. And this is the secret that Silent Lazarus would not reveal, that everyone is right as it turns out. You go to the place you always thought you would go, the place you kept lit in an alcove in your head. Some are being shot up a funnel of flashing colors into a zone of light, white as a January sun. Others are standing naked before a forbidding judge who sits with a golden ladder on one side, a coal chute on the other. Some have already joined the celestial choir and are singing as if they have been doing this forever, while the less inventive find themselves stuck in a big air-conditioned room full of food and chorus girls. Some are approaching the apartment of the female god, a woman in her 40s with short wiry hair and glasses hanging from her neck by a string. With one eye, she regards the dead through a hole in her door. There are those who are squeezing into the bodies of animals, eagles and leopards, and one trying on the skin of a monkey like a tight suit, ready to begin another life in a more simple key. While others float off into some benign vagueness, little units of energy heading for the ultimate elsewhere. The afterlife. Let's, let's go straight for how creative are you going to be next, next time around, <laughs> right? Uh, um, yes, how creative are you going to be? That's actually a great, <laughs> uh, a great lead in. Um, I thought um, that uh, I, Esty and Todd know that I'm, I have a hard, I am a very visual thinker and so it's hard for me to um, think and talk without pictures. So I do have some uh, slides I'd love to share with you as a way of just kind of facilitating the flow of the narrative that I thought I'd open with. And then um, as I think is this, the, the, as I understand the strength of this group, um, one of the strengths of this group is, is that this is really a conversational uh, event. And so i um, hoping that my brief kind of sharing will set the stage for some, some good conversation. That sounds excellent. Feel free to screen share at will. All right. It's working and we see Keynote or PowerPoint or yeah. <clears throat> there we go. Boom. There we go. So um, there's actually two pieces of what I thought would be fun to share with you um, today. Uh, and um, one is just a sort of orientation to what I call the creative constellation framework, which is um, a, a sort of set of tools and concepts that I've been developing over some time to help us think differently about our own selves as creators. Uh, and the second is a kind of way of looking at how this, this new way of thinking about creativity fits into the larger um, socioeconomic political shifts that, um, that we're in. Um, and so, um, that's, I'm gonna sort of give a little taste of each one and then we can decide Collectively, if there's, if you want to go further down either one of those paths, we can do that. Um, so, the creative constellation framework is a set of tools that I've developed to explore a very particular question that we're not used to asking, <laughs> which is the question of how are you creative? Um, and the framework. Uh, it, it's actually kind of stunning in an era where creativity has become kind of a cardinal virtue um, that we don't ask this question uh, around of ourselves and, and of our children, of, of others around us. Um, and so part of the, the interest in looking at the broader picture of the socio-political economic 
kind of context is to understand why haven't we gotten to this question sooner? <laughs> um, so the, the thing itself, the framework that I've developed is really um, made up of two interlocking layers. Um, the first is the idea of creative constellation mapping, the notion that each of us are creative in multiple ways and that we would be helpful to have a sort of menu of options <laughs> to be able to say, which are the ways I'm most creative and how do they interact? What is the system that my creativities create uh, for me? That what are the patterns that are available to me because of the array of ways in which I'm creative? That interlocks with, intersects with a second kind of um, model, which is this notion of a creating process cycle. Um, which really helps to helps us to visualize the kind of terrain that we move through as creators, um, the notion of creating as a process um, uh, with particular sort of universal dynamics, which we experience very personally. Um, and also the notion that each of us within this sort of cyclical process of creating have particular zones of strength um, and areas where we uh, where our creative powers are sort of at their fullest and areas where we need to be collaborating and co-creating with others in order to complete a cycle of creating. So that's the that's kind of the the framework at a really high level. I thought I'd just go quickly to the way that we I think have gotten um, that we've inherited some questions that, that have taken us down a different kind of track. Um, the first is the question, the older question of, are you creative? Um, uh, that sort of comes, comes out of or makes sense as a question within the industrial age, um, where creativity is really sort of more narrowly associated with the arts. Um, where work is really organized, as all of you know, around sort of bureaucratic uh, structures or factory structures, where creativity is really seen as largely external to the economy um, and really as a sort of rarefied talent or trait um, that some folks have and some don't. So in an era where sort of productivity is the economy happening down on the ground with the nose to the grindstone and creativity is the arts which is sort of head in the clouds and dreaming and imaginative um, or to get really you know sort of uh, uh, that that sort of culture and the economy are two separate spheres um, and in that kind of context um, there's there's actually not only a, a sort of binary kind of split between productivity and creativity, but um, a kind of moral uh, overlay around that in the sense that from the perspective of productivity, creativity looks um, very hedonistic, uh, <laughs> um, very sort of, um, uh, what, head in the clouds, airy-fairy, all of those kinds of things. Um, we know that, that the question, are you creative, becomes sort of a sorting hat, you know, for are you going to be able to operate within an economy based where, where, where the values are around conformity, um, obedience, uh, ability, heterogeneity. Um, so the yes answer is sort of, oh dear. <laughs> um, it's associated with poverty, with social ostracism, with addiction, with mental instability. Best if you live in your own colonies or garrets or whatever. Um, and, and, and certainly the idea would be if you are creative that you'd be creative in one way. You're probably a writer, you're a performer, you're a visual artist. Then on the no side, great, you're going to be a good cog, right? <laughs> and, you know, perhaps the quiet desperation is just a passing phase, we'll, we'll, we'll hope. 
So, of course, all the changes we know about in this group particularly <laughs> happened um, and, and really kind of left us in a place where now we're in a world where creativity and the economy are it, it, so swirled together, so um, tied up with one another, they really can no longer be teased apart um, and that they operate in this kind of dynamic system. So the question, are you creative, with the idea that the answer is yes or no, something you have or don't have, is really kind of falling away. Um, although it's still, there, the, obviously the traces of that story are still with us in the sense that um, it's still very possible to find people who will say they don't have a creative bone in their body or you know, by which they usually mean that, they don't, that, that they're, don't, they're not drawn into the arts or, or artistic expression. So we're now more at a place where the question has shifted to how creative are you, right? With the emphasis on getting more creative as the thrust of uh, our sort of self, a sort of self improvement um, uh, ethos, um, where creativity is really because of that intersection with the economy become a kind of central, central cultural virtue. And it really kind of takes us down two paths, which obviously are in relationship to each other. One is the idea of creativity as a key to personal liberation and a sort of self-realization practice. And the other in workplaces is the notion of uh, creativity as a key to business innovation, a driver of the economy. And in that context, more often, the notion is of creativity as an sort of optimizable brain event, right? A sort of hackable uh, technology of the brain that we could engineer to go faster or uh, more or better. I'm going to go just a little bit down that second path primarily and just sort of look at this notion of what happens when creativity and productivity become so entangled. Um, at the extremes of that, we see where creativity is really fully co-opted by the ethos of productivity. Um, we see a lot of what we're seeing now, which is this, this emphasis on turning up the dial to 11, right? Um, which, at, which at one end of the spectrum has to we hear a lot about sort of hacking your daily routine to be more creative, changing your diet to get more creative, having new tools. Um, and then as you go down the spectrum, you get into the trends around microdosing LSD, uh, electric brain stimulators, all of these ideas that relate to this notion that it's sort of this, you know, brain event that we could stimulate more and more um, and get more new ideas before breakfast, so to speak. So the question I think that intrigues me is this, this um, discomfort with that, <laughs> with that direction that we're heading. And this question of, you know, is this, is what we mean by creativity really just sort of productivity on its head? Uh, is it this image from this cover of this 3M, uh, you know, uh, slide deck? Is it the same, you know, productivity guy who's all alone in a sterile field, you know, uh, fully ripped uh, and, you know, indicating his discipline and self-mastery and sort of fully hacked in terms of his uh, daily routines, et cetera. And I think from my work with people who are, um, who are working creators, um, it feels like this is a, we've gone down a, a, the, wrong, the wrong track in that, in that uh, narrative. I think what my work comes from is a place of understanding that creativity is not a brain event, or at least that it doesn't make, it doesn't, isn't very helpful to think of it that way. Uh, that it cannot be separated from the relational context of creating. And SD has been um, a really powerful co-thinker that's really supported uh, my own um, development of, of this um, uh, kind of elaboration of this way of thinking. Um, that creativity doesn't happen in isolation from the world, but rather in response to the world. 
and that it occurs as an enactment of complex interconnectivity both within ourselves, so the interconnectivity of our multiple creativities, um, and between ourselves and the world. So we might embrace a definition of creativity that's much more like a very sort of old fashioned uh, way of thinking of the, the notion of the caring imagination that brings the world to life. Um, so if we're thinking into an economy uh, that relates in a new way to creativity, it really calls us not for just turning, you know, the guy on his head, but a deeper shift in self-concept, in mindset, and in ways of being. So shifting from the notion of the, produ the productive self, um, I act upon the world, um, to a notion of the creative self, I act within the world. Um, and I won't read through all of the all of the bullets here, but but and I think this is a shift that we're seeing and feeling probably in this group from multiple different angles. It would be interesting to have some conversation around that. Um, so there's my little fern. <laughs> so in this context, the idea of getting more creative really leads us not toward brain electric brain stimulation or better drugs, but really toward deepening our engagement with the world, um, attuning to our particular array of responses to the world. In other words, knowing ourselves as creators, understanding the dynamics of creating as a process, uh, learning how we work best as creator among creators, and really growing our skill at extending our caring imaginations into the world. And so this question, how are you creative, which my work is centered on, is really seeing creativity as enactments of the complex interconnectivity within oneself and between oneself and the world. It is the actions through which we evolve and regenerate the world and ourselves. So um, shall I press on and just sort of look, take, the, take a little deeper look into the framework itself? Or would you like to pause and have, have a chance to sort of take in the narrative uh, to date? Um, I think pausing for a second would be good. Um, love where you're going and what you're saying and your beautiful slides. Um, and we're visual and everything else all as well. So um, this really, I think, resonates with a lot of us. And I, I was thinking just of passing the, the floor to Esty um, because she knows you quite well and uh, can sort of add layers of meaning that resonate with us, et cetera. So uh, Esty, what's, uh, you wanna, uh, and Sarah, will you unshare your screen just for a little bit and we'll, yeah. we'll come back to it? Um, it gives me a chance to catch up on the chat as well. Exactly. Uh, I first of all want to say that I'm seeing uh, a whole bunch of these slides for the first time, right? And in a way that I'm sure you'll appreciate having um, experienced Sarah and her creative pr products for even this small interval. It's a delight, right, to kind of have these things emerge in both language and flow, etc. Um, I think, you know, one of the journeys that this, that Sarah and this work have been on is to get beyond this thing where given a, a framework, you turn it into a taxonomy and a, I am this, I am not that, right? It's kind of a, a Myers-Briggs for the creative side of you or some such, um, way of thinking, um, and what one of the corest, one of the most core elements of Sarah's understanding of of creativity is that it is your life. It is your bio. It is ever shifting in that way. From my standpoint, Sarah and I first kind of recognized one another as as children of the same mother when she was insisting that creativity and we as creators are multiple 
that it makes no more sense to think of your talents, as it were, using the old words as singular, as it does to think of your identity as singular and your mind as one mono-minding thing. So um, uh, anyway, at this moment, all I want to say is I'm thrilled to see, uh, to, to, I'm just enjoying this moment of seeing all that complexity and system and sociality, everything reflected in the slides with this group, right? It, this couldn't be, couldn't it be nicer? And I'm dying to hear what you're seeing. So, hey, Tom, hi. <laughs> yeah, Tom, Bo, Todd, do you want to jump in? I'm enjoying this very much. I really like the, the insights and the whole stance of this. I like multiple creativities. I like that it's a being in the world thing. It's not some stupid hero's journey, domination of the world, patriarchal bullshit. I mean, I, I'm, I'm all over this. I also sense a lot of, um, there's, as, as I, I put in the chat, I, I sense a the hermeneutics is all over this too. I see Heidegger here. I see a lot of really great advanced thinking. This isn't, you know, this is, this is built on solid stuff too. Cool. Um, just from the I like, by the way, having it presented to us. I don't like to presume that we all know what, what Sarah has to say. I really like having Sarah tell us what she thinks, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, one of my working assumptions in sort of dreaming up this relationship economy thing is that we're actually born really creative, connected to the world. I think we're born seeing things that we don't see anymore as adults because we then manage to socialize all these insights out of us. And we're living in, you know, modernism and other isms basically have eaten our brains and mostly stamp out our creativity. So we manage somehow work, play, and learning all used to be one circle. They all, they all, they all used to overlap. You know, if, if you look at uh, hunting tribes that go out and they, they're, they're laughing and learning and, and actually doing the work of, of finding food, and we used to do that, we managed to separate it both in terms of our day and in terms of our lifespan, right? So here, this is the and learning part. And, and our identity, exactly. So you have, to, you have to sort of manufacture different aspects of identity for these different roles. And God forbid your LinkedIn profile should be too, too humorous or too <laughs> idiosyncratic or whatever. It's a little bit like having a, a home that has too many odd features so it doesn't look like a vanilla home in the market and loses its value, right? Which is just weird. I have a friend who spent a couple of years with her husband customizing their home. They just like built in bookcases and did intriguing things all over and then had a really hard time selling it because that, that unique buyer that would understand what they had done was apparently not in the market. Anyway. Yeah, it has to be painted white. Yeah, mm -hmm. and has to have granite countertops and a sub-zero fridge and God knows what. You know, it's, there's sort of a standard issue uh, checkbox items for, for real estate these days. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, like, what creativity challenges are we looking at? How, how does this framework fit where we are? Tom, any thoughts? Uh, thank you. Yes, and by the way, Sarah, I'm enjoying this very much. Appreciate it. Um, I, I was just... I think that when I hear a lot in the business world about creativity, that's exactly the problem. It's in the business world. It's seen as a means to an end. It's a means of creating value and wealth. Um, so we're, we're worshiping that. And we're, innovators are now seen as the thing. Everybody is you know, working to make sure that they have one of those kind of words as either entrepreneur or innovator in their title to imply that I'm part of that creative class that's creating value for the world, um, which is good, so, which is something we need to be doing but it's a, a, a narrow application of creativity. And then the other aspect that I was just thinking about is the idea that when you read, um, well, like creativity as a joint experience, as a something we do together, uh, seems to get lost a lot. It, we talk about collaboration, et cetera, but honestly, there's a lot of people in the business world who want to hire that one creative person that will be the creator that we all need. And uh, I'm, I would be interested more in figuring out, as a group, how do we be creative together? Or what does it mean to be the creative? Um, what's my role in that group as we together create something that I couldn't have created myself? Esti, is that called multi-multi-minding? <laughs> we'll make 
do with one multi. Right? Okay, good, because we go too meta meta and suddenly it gets confusing, right? Right, right. If they can talk about the singularity, we can just talk about multilarity. Would you agree? Okay, good. Ooh, multilarity. Um, Todd, any thoughts or? Uh, <clears throat> I, I just want to add an appreciation um, that Sarah talked about economy uh, because the scale of what we're actually talking about here, uh, as Tom alluded to, is much greater than our individual uh, or aggregate creative abilities. Um, I think the, the vision for this framework is, is that it could change the way in, in which we organize and operate um, around creativity. And so I, I'm, I'm, I know how much thought and time and years Sarah has put into this. So this is thrilling to me, uh, both to see her here and to not back down from how big it is. <laughs> yeah, and another thing, you know, I've actually had the job creative director. And uh, oh, I'll say that it completely was a group activity. I mean, I, I shepherded and played with other people. That's what the job was. And it was a blast. And it was not me dictatorially telling everybody and killing their ideas. In fact, I specifically did not do that. I wanted to get their creativity, have them have fun, and get their unique contribution. But I don't think that my business overlords exactly understood that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really becomes about questions of how to, um, how to cultivate the conditions within which people can, um, uh, can do their creating that, that, that um, together and, and that the skills of that cultivation of the environment are itself a form one of the creating modes that I've identified really relates specifically to that. It is one of the ways in which creativity shows up through us is in the ability um, or the, 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 the genius for cultivating environments um, within which uh, living things thrive. And that's part of the human work of uh, of creating as much as it is in a, in a garden or, you know, uh, other settings where we think of cultivation more um, traditionally. It's, it's funny. Um, I, I was just trying to find, while you were presenting, Sarah, I was reminded of something I'd just recently read about just the, the, the total top-down autocratic nature of work, how work ate our universe, how work basically took yeah. over our lives and became central. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's this, uh, this one, the, the case against work, uh, which I've put in my, in my brain at uh, the link I will paste right here in our chat. But basically, uh, you know, <clears throat> our culture is too obsessed with work. Um, we've gotten caught up in a game that deadens our spirits and limits our horizons, et cetera. Um, it's it's um, really interesting how we've allowed this to happen. So I, I, it feels like you're carrying an antidote. And if you'd like to um, go back into uh, your presentation and uh, take us a couple steps further, that'd be great too. I'd like that. And I just want to add one thing, you know, this whole, how come uh, we threw out play? We somehow think work and play are exclusionary, are mutually exclusive. Um, um, everyone I've ever known who really is a rock star, play is definitely part of it. We, why do we give up fun and play? Any, we, kind of think that that's what we have to do and jerry you know we're talking about the prussian educational model here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so let's anyway so uh, let's I'm, I'm ready sarah you keep going i'm, I'm enjoying it. you better not play nine <laughs> nine <laughs> yeah because those of us down here on the earth in productivity town don't have time for play you know productivity town. that's what oh, people do who can't pack it in the you know it's it's a very yeah it's that it's that Split. Pick up the piece and stick it in the machine. Yeah. And yet, if you, and yet, and what we have done in that is to um, externalize 
all of that humanness, the place of feeling and play and responsiveness, sensitivity to the world, by externalizing that into the role of the artist or the musician, then we tap it, they give it back to us after work when we go to the movie or we put on the recording or we tap into the music, but it's not ours. It's there, you know, it, we're just, we, we receive it back as a consumable. Ooh. And, uh, and technology, technology really changed a lot of this because we yeah. used to learn how to play a recorder or a, or a fiddle or whatever. And now you're basically playing a, you know, an MP3 uh, on your phone, which used to be a, an MP3 player, but that went away. Uh, but we've externalized culture to the point also where it's also polished that most of us don't attempt to make culture with each other because it seems so amateur. It seems so crude uh, when it's just us doing it. And, you know, there's still a lot of people out there who understand this and who like learn to play instruments and make, make art with each other. But mostly we've, you know, technology really interfered. And then um, Bo was ooing because uh, a, a big piece of the relationship economy is about the is a complaint about the consumerization of every sphere of our lives. Yeah. That, that we're, we're being treated as mere consumers by every system we interact with, not just consumer goods, but our educational system, our punitive legal policing system, our, you, know, you name it, we're, we're just mere consumers to them. Yeah, I was working at a university where they were really on attack of trying to uh, of changing the language so that you are uh, the students were the customers and the conversation around that isn't what is that's not an appropriate language for the role of student who is and you know a, a co-creator of their learning they are they are investing themselves you know it is it is um and sort of what gets what gets yeah smashed out of our experience and and our, our ability to see see the real dynamics of what's going on because of that mono discourse, uh, you know, uh, is, is um, something to resist, uh, for sure. At cocktail parties and dinner parties, when people ask me what I do, I love to tell them that I'm a dilettante. And, um, because I am. And notice in our culture, what does dilettante mean? It's not a good thing. Do you know what it meant just 150 years ago? It means to delight in. <laughs> <laughs> this is for Bolton. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe after today you can um, you'll adopt the a language that you're a, you're a multimodal creator. Yeah, let's go, let's go, Sarah. <laughs> oh, I, I like that a lot. We could be dilettantes, planeurs, and amateurs. Yes. yes, I like it. I like it. But yes. I, I put in the chat a book called Monoculture, and it's just uh, Sarah, what you're talking about turning consumers, uh, students into consumers. It's the same yeah. idea. We have this overriding idea that is changing all of society, which is economy is the master idea. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's the reason why people thought it was a good idea to put a businessman in charge of a government. Well, we need to have education and governance and business, all as separate universes and really let them be what they are. Unfortunately, we're trying to, we're trying to treat each of those as if they're all businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's causing a lot of loss of the other stuff we need. Yeah. Um, okay, so just to take you one step further into the model itself here, um, and I am not gonna be able to track the chat as we go, so if something's coming up that's a, something we should pause and, and, and answer or talk, speak to, let's um, please feel free to call, my, call me to, to attention to that. So, the idea of the Creative Constellation framework is that I have identified 25 different creative modes and that rather than seeing ourselves as the yes or no, are you, aren't you, that it's really about, um, you know, what select all that apply, not only sort of what's the array of creativities that uh, are expressed through you, but then also the second step of how, how do we make sense of that? What's the significance to us of the way in which those creativities interrelate? So the first underlying assumption here is that not everyone is creative in the same way, that creativity is multiple. Um, and this sort of slide gives me a chance to, you know, when I'm talking about this with people to sort of have us take a look at sort of 
would we agree that these are all creative people? And yet what they are, the kinds of puzzles that, you know, part of, part of creativity is finding out which kinds of problems feel like play to you to solve, <laughs> right? And so the, each of these creators has a different kind of play, a different kind of problem that feels like play to solve. The, the um, thinking here is not, is very similar, right, to Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences, where he, in the, it wasn't that long ago in the 1980s that he sort of disrupted the notion of intelligence as a single thing uh, and invited us to, to shift the question from are you smart to how are you smart? And so this is a very similar move that I'm making with creativity. But I think he, I think there are like eight intelligences in his, um, in Gardner's model. And, you know, Einstein said creativity is intelligence having fun. Um, so my thought was, you know, when I was trying to sort out how many of these creative modes could there be, certainly our, our multiple intelligences can have multiple ways of having fun. And so it really, I found 25 to be sort of irreducible. Um, I worked really hard to reduce it further, but um, that's kind of what I, where I've landed. So not only are there these multiple ways of being creative, but many people are creative in multiple ways. Um, if we look at Alice Waters, for example, um, who is the, the um, has become a, a leader of the sort of slow food movement and the Edible Schoolyards project, um, started out as a maker, as a chef. Um, was unhappy with the quality of the food that she was able to serve, and so became a cultivator of uh, learning about organic foods. She also came of age in the 60s in Berkeley and had a strong sort of disruptor streak, uh, which in my model really relates to um, the notion of um, re being at a spot of, of ending what doesn't work and creating the conditions for renewal into to a new cycle. And so she began, you know, she saw the ways in which um, the, um, the monoculture of food and the, the, the corporate structures around food were injuring us all. And so became this sort of moved into social innovator mo mode, developing this edible schoolyard project, um, which tapped into her uplifter mode as a teacher, but also ultimately positioned her to step really into leader mode as a kind of um, uh, spokesperson and way shower um, or for many, many others around the um, uh, issues of, of close to her heart uh, of food and community. So, my thinking is that it is your combination of creativities that is sort of the guidance system that can lead you to those places of greatest satisfaction to you, but also the greatest contributions to the world. So as Esty was pointing out earlier, the notion is that your constellation is not a type. It's a flexible tool for exploration that allows for evolution and growth over time. One of the things that helps us to see is that we are meant to be expressing those, the, the major modes in our constellation are, um, we sort of feel it in the inverse when we're not creating in those ways, we're somewhere on a spectrum from gritchy and irritable <laughs> to fully depressed. And, um, and so it can also be a way of sort of tracking back to our own wellness, um, those parts of our wellness that are tied to the expression of our creativities. For people, you know, like um, probably mo many of us, but, you know, certainly Bo has expressed this, <laughs> um, the notion of like being too creative, like too many things, too many directions, this is a model that helps to reframe what feels like excess within the productivity model as a sort of asset um, that it helps 
to identify areas of strength and challenge within the creating process. And I think importantly, it's different from sort of a strength finders model in the sense that it really, um, the way that I've framed the creative modes relates to the um, a way of understanding yourself in terms of the outcomes you're designed to create. Um, so it's really focused on impact. What is it that I'm built to create? What is it that some, only someone with my array of creativities can, can bring forward in the world, rather than traits or qualities? So the kinds of questions it opens up are sort of what are the relationships between your creativities how do they work together as a system? What are the contributions that are possible with this array of creativities? And what collaborators do you need in order to see the work of your creative imagination manifested fully in the world? So I just, I, I love this um, framing of it from Nora Bateson um, who uh, talks about this kind of, it, you know, as a sort of practical capacity that we require in, in our world that we're now, the complexity of the world that we're in now. That developing an understanding of the patterns and processes of interdependent, inter, interdependency in complexity is, this, is, is sort of supremely practical for us right now in terms of both in terms of our own inner complexity and also our interdependencies with one another in the world. So the, the second layer, so there's these 25 modes, um, some of which, some number of which um, you resonate with as being major modes within your constellation. But all of that kind of lays over this second layer, which I just will build up for you real quickly here. So the idea is that within the creating process cycle, really there are these four um, spaces. There's the space of generation when ideas are new and flowing and all things are possible. <laughs> um, there's the layer of uh, the, the zone of manifestation where those ideas are being made tangible. Um, there's a space of release and connection where things are brought in, new cultural forms are brought into conversation with the world. And there's this space of the void, the places in between um, where um, we're in a, in a time of um, what can feel like nothingness, particularly in the West, or emptiness, um, but which other cultures have a much clearer insight into the dynamics of all that's happening in that void space. So here's just, um, oh, I forgot I had all these words on this slide. Let me just flip through them for you. I thought they were. And one of the things about the void, of course, is that it really is a time of rest and reflection, which our productivity driven cultural ethos has kind of um, flattened or diminished um, and, and or um, kind of uh, uh, made into an illness, um, uh, you know, that we treat our depression, our times of deep rest, um, as uh, evidence of, of, of a kind of illness, um, as opposed to a, a, a moment within the, within the cycle. The cycle. Uh, a question, Sarah. Yeah. Where do external things happen, good and bad, but maybe mostly bad, like uh, the stresses of poverty, um, people, you know, haters who hate your work, uh, moments, sort of moments of, of social stress that motivate your work, all those kinds of things. Where do they come in uh, to the model? There's a couple. Um, uh, uh, let me go one step further and see if it answers that. Um, oh. And I don't know that it will uh, as fully as as we all might like. <laughs> so see, see, if this, see if this next piece helps a little bit. So one, the, ne the question that comes after this picture, which is, okay, so we're going around this cycle, um, is 
how, what are the ways in which we sustain, what are the forces that help us to sustain forward momentum in, this, in, the, in the creating process? What are, the, what are the things that slow us down or make us stuck? Uh, and what are the things that even flip us into a backward si cycle, a sort of fear-driven, um, sort of anti-creative cycle? And I won't go into all of that, but but those are the sort of questions under that that come up next. I think. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> so I, I, love, I love how you have the void in there, by the way, um, and it just it really resonates with me. And I, I re that's the part that I actually myself and other creatives hide from the people around from the business heads around us. We hide that from them yeah. because it makes them scared. All they want to see is, and I, I used to always get this, well, no one else has done it. You know, oh God, but please continue. But I love this. this yeah, I mean, I, th I think that that is the piece that if we do not, if we don't acknowledge it, name it, reckon with it, we are not in a creating world. We, yes. in some other world, but that is sort of, um, defining of the creative experience as opposed to some other experience that might have common features. <laughs> um, so, so if the question is then what drives momentum, the first answer I think is a set of practices that creators over time learn to cultivate that sort of are both within also with others, um, but they're, they're sort of these core practices of, of caring, um, in other, of, of sort of investing our, our caring attention in the world or in the thing that we're doing. The thing with creating, of course, is that it involves falling in love with things that don't yet exist. <laughs> and oh, yeah. so sustaining that caring for something that no one else can maybe see is a real is one of those challenges that that um, creators face. Um, stay, you know, caring also renders us vulnerable, and so that's another place that gets um, uh, that makes us nervous within the productivity ethos, right? Um, because it smacks of vulnerability. So trusting, um, uh, both trusting in one's own. Uh, one's own creative, trusting your ability to sort of meet the moment when it arises, your own, uh, your own intuition, but also, of course, trusting your co your co creators and trusting the process itself. Um, presencing uh, the notion of sh on the first first level is showing up, <laughs> and then second level is the quality of the attention that you bring to the the being present. Practicing the notion of, of um, continual learning and skill building in an intentional way. Risking, um, again, uh, the notion, you know, a vulnerable notion of um, practicing the sort of what the hell, <laughs> I'm doing it anyway, kind of, because it requires to go beyond what, what is known or what has been done before, always requires this sort of leap off the cliff, right? Um, inquiring the, the, the notion of bringing one's curiosity, um, asking more questions than the next person, <laughs> um, digging deeply not only into what is possible, but also what is, what is really, what do I really see? What is really happening here? Um, and playing. So here we're, we're, we're back, another key word for, for Bo is that, that notion that, that play is one of the core practices of creating. Um, and again, without the presence of these kind of core practices, I think we're in some other space other than the, the creating space. The other factor in the model that I think supports our, our creative momentum is what I sort of call, it's sort of Tolkien-esque here, but <laughs> the, the ring of guidance, right? There's that, that there are other people uh, in the world who, and some of those other people are particularly skilled. They, their creativities are clustered or heightened in the areas of, in creative modes which relate to guiding others. So there's a set of those, we'll look at them in a second, but, but that we're in a system that's, that has um, uh, in it other people who are designed, who have the special 
capacities uh, to help us kind of grow and evolve and move around the cycle, um, who hold us when uh, we are stuck or going in reverse, <laughs> um, who teach us, who cultivate, and this is what, you know, who cultivate the, the way um, and who help us heal, all of those kinds of things. So there's sort of three caveats to this like crazily perfect circle idea <laughs> that doesn't really help us very much um, or, or sort of keeps us in a sort of perf perfect little circle kind of way of thinking. The first is that, of course, there's an evolutionary kind of piece to this, that, that growth is happening here. So there's a spiral piece. But I think the second caveat is even more important, which is that creating isn't one pass through the cycle, that creating is fractal, that it is multiple mini cycles within a larger cycle of creating. So what, what part of the implication of that is that we are in cycles that include voids at small and larger scales all the time. And so for that reason, we need the third caveat, <laughs> which is that creating, the experience of creating is one of surging forward followed by times of retracting inward, right? And this is also, a, again, you see sort of that in this great wave image, that fractalness of it, right? We are we are, you know, even the cycle of a day, you surge forward, you retract inward for reflection. Um, and in our lifetimes, we have periods of much larger, um, re, you know, sort of retraction spaces where we need to do that kind of retreating before we push forward again. Very sort of different from the linear ever upward, you know, kind of image of, of, product, of the productivity curve. Um, just a really yeah. tiny, really small side note, Sarah, but I just typed it into the chat. Um, uh, Hokusai basically painted this same scene like four or five times in his lifetime. Have you seen that? Yes. It makes a really beautiful example of, of sort of the evolution of creativity in his life because that, that massive transformative sort of abstract wave at the end is really, really different from the first three renderings at different, you know, and, and decades go by. <clears throat> between his attempts to paint this scene. It's really interesting. Yeah. Hey, and, and Jerry, by the way, look at this, look at this graphic, Jerry. There you are, cross-pollinator, curator, matchmaker. I've never <laughs> seen a model more clearly identify you, Jerry. Woohoo. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so what happens when we overlay the two things is that that the, mo the 25 modes tend to cluster around these spaces of the creating process. And so there are, there are a set of modes that relate to sort of the direct expression of those, those um, core practices, which I call the essentialist modes. There are a set that relate to the generation space, um, which are the generators. There's a set that are around manifestation, which are the manifestors, that release and connection phase of creating where, where Bo's identifying Jerry has some major, major modes in his constellation. Um, I call the sort of connectors uh, grouping. And then there are this set of guides. And I just have a couple, if you, just one more, um, uh, go, go one more step sort of into this. So this is kind of what it can look like as people start to work with plotting their constellations onto, um, onto the model, a couple different um, views of, of folks who have, who have uh, mapped theirs out. But um, so those essentialist modes are the cultivator mode, which relates um, to that core practice of caring um, and also presencing, maybe more, but the witness mode, which is really the sort of the mode in which we're fully sort of embodying the notion of presencing, of simple observation without judgment. The play artist mode, which is the mode in which we're sort of 
expressing that core practice of playing. Um, delight, uh, wonder, all of those things are part of the, 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 the mode of play artist. The investigator mode, which is sort of the, the core mode relating to the inquiring or the, the curiosity um, core practice. And adventurer mode, which relates to many of these actually, but really sort of inquiring into the, into the world through direct experiences of, of adventure. Um, I'm going to, I, I don't want to take uh, too much time, so the, but I'll just preview the other modes for you. So the generator modes are um, a designer mode, expressionist, which relates to the expression of one's inner um, uh, states of uh, sort of creating representations of one's inner, uh, inner reactions to the world. So it's where many of the people we think of in terms of, of being artists kind of uh, fit, in, fit in there. Um, inventor mode, thinker mode, and social innovator mode. Um, and so the notion of generators sort of well in possibility, there's some common threads that generators share. Manifestor modes are sort of the maker mode, um, choreographer mode, which choreographers create the conditions for harmonious um, co-creativity. Um, systematizers um, who create order so that manifestation can occur. Um, refiners who um, take um, rough or unfinished things and make them polished and whole, uh, and analysts, uh, analyst mode. I'm gonna skip the summary. Connector modes, um, matchmaker, interpreter. Um, so interpreter is a connector mode because they are uh, taking existing cultural material and embodying it in a way that translates it to an audience as a musician, as an actor, as a lawyer, as a professor, there's many different sort of professions that draw upon the interpreter mode. Curator who creates um, arrangements, or, you know, who creates through selection and arrangement. Um, and cross-pollinators who create uh, points of interpenetration between disparate uh, ways of thinking or, or domains of thought or action. And then there are the there are the guiding modes, um, so uplifter, um, storyteller, leader, mystic, and healer. And I think, yeah, I, I'm gonna I'll stop there, <laughs> partly because we're out of time, I think, but um, but also that gives you a sense, I think, of sort of the the way in which those two, uh, two layers, the 25 modes and the creating process cycle um, kind of overlap and, and, and how those cluster together. Um, so that one's constellation isn't necessarily within one space or another, but it's how you work around, you know, where your strengths and, and uh, interplay is around the cycle of um, wow, Sarah, fantastic work. I mean, that must, I, I can tell that must have taken you years. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, it was one year just to illustrate all the modes. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> but the, the thinking behind it was, was years before that. So I, I'm very grateful to, um, that that comes through in, in, in terms of You've reached a clarity of expression with all of this framework that's really lovely to, to watch. I mean, it, it, it lays itself out. Um, you walk through it well. The words you've chosen are, are illustrative and descriptive of the things you're trying to say, <clears throat> right? Uh, although Essie just nodded no. No, yeah, oh, no, I'm nodding yes. <laughs> oh, okay, that was a vehement <laughs> yes, no. Um, and yeah. also, and I don't know if you know this, but our calls usually run 90 minutes. So if you can stay with us, we oh, have another, another 30 minutes. What a minutes. gift. Yeah, oh, that's so, great. This is like a bonus round. This is uh, yeah. I was like, I was in the tyranny of the hour. Um, exactly, exactly. We can I'm, all le I'm level up here and keep talking. Uh, so, uh, hey, I wanted, I wanted to 
pop in here or have us come back to your question about what about the yeah. shit that happens, right? Um, be, uh, yeah. So whether that's now or in a few minutes in our bonus time. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. I was, I was going to go there too. I was just interested in what anybody else, where anybody else wanted to take uh, what Sarah has, has shown us. What I really like about Sarah's model is, uh, so all of us are taught to extinguish our creativity. We're all taught that it's somebody else, that it's not us, you know, the, uh, it's some other expert out there. Um, and what, I, I, what I'd really like to see on Sarah's mission in the world is go out there and show everybody, yeah, everybody's creative. That lawyer is creative. Did you know she mentioned lawyer? How many people think lawyers are creative? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, the, this, the way we've just uh, <clears throat> stigmatized and shoved creativity into a corner, yet we, we live on it. We live in a world that would be horrible without it. I mean, so I really like I really like I really like to see Sarah's mission as teach show the world that everyone's creative and how it actually works. And let's and, and by the way, Sarah, I, I can't help but notice how few things were in the void. You know, when you were talking constellation. Yeah, world. I mean, I think that I think that what my sense is is that the um, different modes, diff different of the other creative modes have different relationships to the void. So, Ooh, wow. so, that, so that people who are very strong manifestors, for example, tend to be very, have, the, the, have a great, greatest struggle with the void. Where people who are gener strong generators tend to think of the void as the space from which the new stuff is gonna come. And yeah. so it's not that it's easy, but it's easier to make sense of it. People who are guides have a sense because they think in terms of an evolutionary uh, or a, a natural process that includes, you know, cycles and cycles of birth and death and regeneration um, are, are particularly suited to helping other people when, you know, come, come through those void times. So it's not, I, while I haven't placed any of the creative modes specifically in the void. We might put mystic there. Um, yeah. That would be one way to think about it. Think about what a mystic is, is that they sort of hold the space for the void, <laughs> help us kind of engage with that. I think that's a big... Uh, you know what, I, I think there's one reason we have a big problem with the void, and I think it's the reason, is this dominant patriarchal culture of ours thinks in only its solar dominant power. And the void is about surrender. Yes. And Western culture does not understand surrender mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. If, you know, and it, it, you have to really kind of go outside of that to find ways of thinking about the, what they call the fertile void. I, I don't know what that, I know that term. Yes. Yeah. And so there's, there, like in Tibetan thought, there are, I forget, there's like a, a set of, you know, countless different energies that are all, ha all at work in the void. Um, that have been named, you know, that we all we see is nothingness. Mm -hmm. And fear and dread. <laughs> and fear cartographers and dread. of the void. And, you know, just, yeah, act, do more, act faster, numb out, you know, whatever. The thing, see, the thing I see with corporate managers is, and it's just, they wonder why they can't innovate and why there's so little innovation. And I think it's quite simple. Most of them are taught to get things done, to look at to-do lists. They're administrators. And there's no void there. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're taught to destroy, stop voids from ever happening, you know? Right. The void only happens there's to them in crisis. There's something that intimate relationship between our capacity for stillness and emptiness that the void requires and our capacity for generative work in the world, th those, are, those are so closely connect it like we really can't do generative work in the world without building our capacity for stillness and and holding the void both the letting go and the grief parts of it but also the um the general you know the fertile part of it oh you're speaking my oh <laughs> hey sarah <clears throat> you, yeah, i, I love, can imagine i'd love to see your library sarah <laughs> <laughs> 
the, the different groups each have a different, there, there's probably, if you look at the language for like the manifestors and the gener generators, but the generators probably have a much more comfort with that, that void, you know, the beginner's mind or uh, finding a stillness. And I often found that in business, there's a, there's a propensity to constantly be doing. If you're not doing, then you're not adding value. And the idea of somebody sitting still and thinking deeply or allowing their mind to just cleanse. Um, but then th these people actually do have ways of valuing this stillness. They'll, they'll talk about needing a vacation to recharge. Those mm -hmm. So I, it would be fun just to explore the different languages um, for each group to see what are the pro and con ways of spinning that void. Um, but I had a bigger question because I love the idea. I thought you were doing this to your finger and you did put a, a spiral in your your uh, chart there. Can you explain a little bit what you were thinking about? Um, in terms of the spiral? Yeah. yeah. I think there's this twin notion that when we are doing the work of creating, we are, we are both um, evolving the world, moving the world forward, and evolving ourselves. So it's, it's, it's both and at the same time. So there's discovery and... Um, but Sarah, I'm uncomfortable here. Where's my binary? Hmm? Where's my <laughs> dualism? I'm starting to feel anxious. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as we, as we move around that spiral, if, and here, okay, you're going to really like this bow. If, if we are not um, allowing and surrendering to the void, we, we, we are going around and around the cycle at one level, right? So we, we can keep going around and around in a flat kind of way. And it is actually our experiences of the void which deepen and broaden us in part. It's our experience of all the challenges of creating that, that, that grow us, that, that we learn from, that, that expand, our, expand who we are. Um, but there's a particular role that, that if we want to be moving sort of upward and outward as the spiral uh, implies, that, that there's a there's an expanding and growing and, uh, you know, uh, elevating kind of process at work. You, we are, if we are meeting the challenges of creating, we are building our muscles and creating of ourselves people who are capable of bigger challenges the next time around, right? That we are, um, you see this with artists too, that you can see an artist who is, um, has, has come up with one sort of style or one kind of painting and because of the, because of their own fears, lack of capacity to risk, or because of the requirements of the marketplace, they can stay in that zone for years and years and years and years. And they don't really, at some point, they're not really creating anymore in, in the model that I'm, that I'm suggesting. They're, they are reproducing. But, but to really move to another cycle where you're generating something truly new, you have to reckon with the, the void space and also not turn back from all of the challenges that come up along the way in that journey of creating. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's amazing how you, you're the professor of creativity. I mean, it's amazing <laughs> how you can put words and shape around this, Sarah. You realize this is really unique. By the way, as an artist, if I, you know, if I were going to demonstrate what you just said about artists, I would show mid-career de Kooning versus late de Kooning. Well, Stella's my favorite example, too. Stella changed uh, styles dramatically from era to era, just seriously learning and growing. Uh, and there's a, we, there's a whole conversation to be had about art. So let me take us into the, uh, the other part because we're gonna, we are now gonna run out of time. Um, first, love the clarity, love the model. Uh, as Bo's been describing, you've really put the work in and you explain it really well and it's going and I wanna know, but this is not my question, I wanna know how are you manifesting this? Is, is there an app for this? I mean, seriously, you could probably do great business with a self-diagnostic coaching app 
<clears throat> that takes people through this at their own pace. Think Saw, uh, Khan Academy <clears throat> for creativity um, in what you're doing with some videos and some other stuff. I can, I can easily envision that as being a useful, profitable thing. Um, the, and then I'm going to make, I think, I think my suggestion is maybe your next book or somebody's next book to complement what you've done because I love what you've done, but it feels like what you've done is the light side. I don't mean lightweight. I mean the bright optimistic side of creativity. And there is this gigantic dark side. I mean, I collect biographies of, fam of famous creative people because most of them are trying to overcome unresolved childhood trauma. Most of them are trying to prove themselves to their parents or were abused as children or whatever. <clears throat> look at the North American abstract artist, look at your average poet, uh, some of the great novelists. The, the demons in their lives were what pushed them way beyond what ordinary mortals were doing <clears throat> or competition with others or anybody who, who was really pioneering the next new thing, which a hundred years later, we're like, well, of course, then impress impressionism shows up. Well, Paris Salons hated the impressionists hated them. They were ostracized. They were criticized. They weren't paid any money, nothing. You know, so, so every innovator of the next new creative thing is, is like really unpopular for a while until they're the person, until they're the popular one, which unfortunately for a lot of people happens well after they're dead. So I also have a presentation I did long ago I called Dark Innovation. You said, you know, who thinks lawyers are creative? <clears throat> lawyers are incredibly creative because they've passed legislation to prevent things from happening around overprotecting intellectual property, around a whole series of things. Like, like there's creativity being used in very underhanded ways all the time as well. And I think the names and the forces of that, I can start, as I was watching what you were showing us, I'm like, oh crap, there's this sort of complementary dark side to backside of the coin, which is also fueling creativity and innovation, <clears throat> um, not always with good intent or for good purpose, uh, but sometimes with remarkable results that we think of as the best art and the best creations in our culture, right? Um, and so, so there's this, real, I have this very torn, uh, one of my more cynical theories is that, is that it takes personal trauma to achieve great creativity. That if you had a great level-headed childhood raised by lovely parents and followed a, a normal path into, you, you preserve your original childlike creativity and you manage to grow up and have a normal life, would you be able to achieve the kinds of, you know, the high levels of art that we've seen people do? I don't know, because maybe it requires obsession to get there. And yeah. maybe, maybe I'm also uh, making a distinction between like some top level of, of freakish creativity and your, the rest of creativity. I don't know. Is that where you're going, Bo? Yeah. I you're doing, there's a cult of creativity I think you're addressing and uh, which is like, it's a dark thing. I'm, I don't know, I'm a little, I'm not in entire agreement with you here, my friend. Good, uh, good. I think I I'm want- I'm trying also be, to be provocative here. I'd really like, sir, to like help everyone realize that they're all creative and they're all there. And by the way, please don't see trauma in a binary. Well, those of us who went through it can also be very thankful for it as I am. I mean, I, I see the world and, it, and it's in a brighter, I see, I see it in colors and brightness that I think that people may have normal childhoods and no, will never see it. May, it may be considered a gift. Let's think of, you know. Uh, and and uh, uh, just as a side note, um, in, in my thinking about community formation, I think true community, I'm borrowing here from Scott Peck, true community mostly happens after a crisis. That mm -hmm. a community that thinks it's in community but it hasn't really been through the grind somehow, probably would leave if, if push came to shove. So, so it's difficulty, it's, it's a little bit like a good perfume uh, starts with a, a really smelly base note, right? Uh, ambergris or something, musk or something like, oof, thank God we covered that over. But that, that's what makes the really good perfume. So, so uh, sorry, that was many things at once, Sarah. And, <laughs> and I wanna emphasize how much I love what you've created. I'm just like, wow, is there a second work here behind the curtain? Yeah, I mean, I think part, part of what, and SD is dying to jump in. Acknowledging, Sorry. and that I think is really critical to acknowledge, is that there is this fantasy, um, which is fueled in part by the industry that's grown up around that, that piece, that getting more creative industry around creativity as self-realization, that suggests that, that creativity is meant to be effortless, that it's about effortless flow, when in fact it's incredibly challenging. It, what it is is it's the challenges that we are built to withstand, right? 
And so, and it is by withstanding those challenges and moving through them that we evolve ourselves. And so people who have in early life or at any point um, significant challenges, it is the, it is the, the, um, the, the skills, the muscles, the, the capacities that are built in, in um, uh, addressing those challenges that make, uh, that evolve us, that, that make us able to create. And so it is, there is a relationship between challenge and creating and, and effort and creating, you know, that it is, um, I think that we, some of the ways we've gone off track in terms of understanding this are, are the notion of effortlessness, but also that notion of that we do our children a favor if we, if we, instead of saying, you know, if we, we ask, we constantly ask them what their passion is, partly because of this singularity of that, but partly because of the notion that, um, that you're supposed to find it and that it's that, that it's then uh, never going to change. Uh, and, and so the notion of that through heading into a passion, meeting the challenges of that passion is going to grow you into a person who might be ready for a different kind of challenge, you know, and that over time what happens, I think, in, in sort of mature, our maturing is that we come from, we move from a sort of simplistic understanding of ourselves through this kind of complexity of all of the capacities or, or drives or interests or, you know, that, that are within us, all of our creating modes. And out the other side is something that can feel actually very simple. It's a kind of integrated, um, you know, sense of, uh, of, of how the parts fit together as opposed to understanding ourselves as a series of fragments. Mm -hmm. There's a poem I love that has the phrase that our intricate wholeness that I think is, you know, what I'm sort of driving at here. And part of it too is that I am a very sort of optimistic, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of driving toward the positive all the time, but, but, the, but the truth is, of course, that the, that the kind of challenge and effort involved is not um, to be under, Estimated. Can, can I jump, jump in? Please, Esty, you're dying to. I, I, yeah. Thank you. So one of the things that I see, I saw the conversation going into was a kind of assumption that one is one of these mode types, right? Oh, Jerry's the connector releaser. Oh, I'm a manifester, right? And part of the power of this and the truthiness of this work <laughs> is that no one is in one sector. Your creativities, right, pop up in some ways in the strangest places, at, at least. And so for me, the first time I heard Sarah talk about her work, the first thing she said was the void, which was the notion of that changed everything for me. I, I had experienced several cycles of writing this book I've been working on. And each time I got to the void, it was, it was a failure. I mean, I had failed yet again. And then I sort of picked myself up and kept going, but there was this sense of accruing failure that the void took, took away. The second thing was to realize that all of these things that are basically my social competencies or my, you know, ways of being in the world that, that, that were relational, but the first word that came to me was social, that I had never in my life, right, thought of as, um, as creativity, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I urge everyone to sort of, in using whichever of Sarah's tools um, works for you to kind of do that give yourself that opportunity to sort of see yourself in this, you know, uh, cluster of, of, of creativities and then to do, um, to take it the next step, which is to have someone you love or 
collaborate with deeply. Love and collaborate with deeply. <laughs> right, do it. So uh, another big moment in my um, uh, onboarding this work and becoming, you know, help me to Sarah is amongst my identities, right, is having my husband use the card deck in this case and then sharing my constellation map and his with Sarah, who had not met him, had not heard much about him at that point, who made such astounding observations about how his world works and mine, and the fact that they are very different and my world isn't even on his map, right? Quite literally. So, um, uh, and so this is kind of an urge for not going into next books or dark sides, like that there's enough dark in the void and there's enough dark in all the difficulty of everyday dealing with others and systems that behave, right, not as expected, because that's the way the world is. Like, we, we don't have to go looking for the dark side. It shows up every day, big and small. Um, <laughs> to, to, let me just say that the, the next book, I mean, not that the first book exists yet, but in the grand scheme of things, the next book is actually one, as I've thought of it, uh, called The Five Crises of Creating. <laughs> because I do think that, that in addition to the void, every time there are these spaces between each of those, um, each of those four spaces within the cycle liminal spaces perhaps. threshold places what's that liminal threshold whatever yeah yeah there are these threshold places where as you move from the void into generation there is a crisis place as you move from generation into manifestation there is a crisis place as you move from manifestation into release and connection there is a massive <laughs> Uh, 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 sort of crisis place. And each of them requires you to withstand different type of fear and challenge. And, you know, so I think that um, it, it is a different way of thinking about it than what, what you were, you know, kind of raising Jerry in terms of, of um, sort of the, the, the way in which we, cr we can create great things out of response to real darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I, I do think that, that it's my impulse too, to sort of do go further into terms of addressing really what we're talking about here in terms of what is required of us as human beings, um, you know, mm -hmm. walking through this, this cycle, but it, and that's why all those caveats, I, you know, it's like, we're not just zipping around this, you know, <laughs> this cycle, like a record, you know, riding a record player, you know, um, that there's, there's, there's this, uh, real, uh, challenge. Exactly. Oh, thank you. Let me stop in one, <clears throat> one more thing. Go ahead, Essie. Um, um, I think, Sarah, you called it the fern today, right? What I think of as the, the fractal nature of, does everyone have in their mind the image? It's a green plant, right? That's right. Um, uh, so not only are you going through space up, right? But it's like, uh, a, a journey in each of us, you know, I, I know pieces, though I know, I think I have a, a, a less sense of you in, but, but of everybody else here, of our journeys, right, over our, and, and these like, I don't know what those round things are called, right, but you have multiple of them, and they're all still alive and growing, and part of the dealing with, uh, with the shit that happens is to be able to kind of shift from one to the other to recognize, well, if I can't do, if it, this is, this is shut down for the moment, but there's this piece of it and that, and they're all happening. So um, again, a plea for this, the, 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 the multiple simultaneous levels of, of us as, as social animals, right? Um, and 
Uh, and then last thing, because I always have to do my little bit of work as, as the representative of, of, of uh, gender, right, is, you know, Liz Gilbert's uh, book, Big Magic, um, Liz Gilbert being she who wrote Eat, Pray, Love and has been a celebrity writer ever since, is all about the fact that pain, the assumption that pain, great pain goes with great art and that great trauma which leads to great pain, leads to, to great art, is really suspect, right? And in some ways is an embodiment of the hero journey, right? Um, and the marginalization of creativity up in the clouds there, where, you know, where else would you put people with, who were incapacitated towards the, right, anyway. Um, so if we can, um, um, embrace the pain of, of the void and the challenges in between, right, without, I don't know. Anyway, um, I felt, I have felt incredibly, literally empowered to keep going, right, by Sarah's observations of other humans, right? Um, it just feels so real and right. Um, her, 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 not only her speaking and drawing, but the actual nature of these, of these modes. So that's it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. That was wonderful, Leslie. Thank you. I, I don't know how to make a better note. The hero's journey down <clears throat> is the toxic, one-sided, patriarchal mess of bullshit that it is. So just can I, I, I was in a coffee shop the other day talking, I have a loud speaking voice, and I was talking <laughs> with my sister, and at the next table was a man with his laptop who was overhearing what we were saying. And something we were talking about prompted him to, as he closed his laptop, stand up and say to me, you know, I'm a, I'm a real serious writer, and um, one of my sadnesses in life is that I have these children who are now adult children, who, um, who I really wasn't able, because I'm a real serious writer, I really wasn't able to give them, you know, the, the love and care that I would have liked to. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that is a very specific way <laughs> of apprehending what it means to be a real serious creator right? Which is to say it's this thing that is separate from one's relationships uh, mm. to one's children and to the, to the larger world. And that, um, and so I suggested to him that, that perhaps those, perhaps he actually, part of his sadness was that he was wanting to create in both ways and only could allow himself to create in the one, or he wasn't meeting his own definition of what it meant to be real and serious about the what what he what it meant to him to be an art maker and so if i think it's you know this is gets to that gendered uh conversation that what women have had to do uh out of life circumstances is to figure out what it means to be a real serious creator and be interruptible and be giving care to others and be uh you know tending to and see, if only somebody had thought about what this means and what to call it. <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you interrupted Sarah, Jerry. I know. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I saw Esty just beaming. Yeah, too. but, yeah, but it, we're, we're all connected. And, and Sarah, that was, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, Bo was saying, like, your mission, you know, part of my mission is to, to, to sort of, interrupt these narratives about what it means to be a real whatever but also if we're all if it's something we're all part of then let's own our part of it our multiple parts of it and let's let's understand the dynamics of what that calls from us so that we can we can we can contribute most fully from you know from the array of things that we're capable of as opposed to you know, 
having these narratives that say in order to be successful or to be whatever, to register as serious, you must reduce your life to the one thing. Um, that doesn't feel real to me or to the experiences of the people that I know and observe. Yeah. Thank Sarah, you. could you address something? I, I think I, I'm indicating I call the hero's journey bullshit. But what I mean about the hero's journey, it's a very one-sided thing. It's like taking a piece of your model and saying, this piece over here is the only valuable part. There's no other way to be a contributor in the world unless you're a warrior. That's what, so would you speak that? So I want to make it clear that I, I don't think there's no value in the hero's journey. I just think it's a very one-sided way to yeah. look at things. Yeah. I mean, I, I, think you're, I think you're saying it. I mean, I think it is that um, it, is, it, it is placing the sort of primacy on the narrative of, it, you know, individual conquering, uh, you know, a sequence of challenges that, you know, th through, you know, through which they, by defeating them, <laughs> you know, they, they, they become the, the hero and, um, and the, the counter to that, that's sort of embedded in this, in this model is that we are all these interconnected nodes who are, as we evolve ourselves, as we meet the challenges, we are making, we are changing, you know, and evolving, moving the world forward. And that it's so, so that ultimately our journeys, you know, individually are part of something that's so, so much larger. Um, and, and that, and that our journeys aren't just our journeys in the first place, right? That, that, that we are part of one another's journeys. Um, and so, it, you know, what it means to be heroic in that context is really, I think, about um, sh shifting in, in mindset from to to a different model of of heroism, which is really about am I um, have I grappled with the complexity of of who I am and of the world that I find myself in, and have I done the hard work of finding those places where um, the, what the world is calling for, you know, meet up with what my inner needs are and, and, and moving from there. And that's mm -hmm. not, you know, that, that is a journey, right? <laughs> that's, those are hard questions. Those are really hard questions that we spend lifetimes wrestling with on and off. It's, um, this may just reveal my lack of literacy on that hero's journey and so forth, but I've interpreted it um, very much as the kinds of initiation or forging that I was talking about earlier in community formation. So I, for me, it's not about slaying the Cyclops and avoiding the sirens. <clears throat> for me, it was about overcoming your demons and being alone and being resourceful and figuring out how you connect to your story into the world in a different way so that you can come back into your place in society changed and better and ready for stuff. So, I, so I've, I've, I've kind of ignored the trappings of combat and, and male overcoming, you know, killing things, part of the, the hero's journey. Uh, and, and I'm very aware of the lack of initiation and the lack of bringing young people up into society that's happened. We've, we've shredded all the forms that we had to bring young people. I mean, there's still bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. That, that's a form of initiation, right? But, but most other cultures don't have uh, this kind of thing. And, and I think that without it, we end up missing uh, parts of our lives. We end up missing entrance into adulthood. We end up missing uh, being, being, being introduced properly, being reintroduced properly into a community that knew us as children and that is now going to know us and help us as adults. And so all of that factors in for me. So I'm not, I'm not as big a hater of the hero's journey as you are, Bo. I hate the distortion of it. Uh, me too. Sarah has addressed everything we're talking about. It's about being in the yeah. world in relation with other people. Yeah, and also the questiness of it and the fact that the hero, you, you, it's not hard to find quotes from 
cultural heavyweight saying that there's really only one plot, only one narrative, and it's the hero's journey. That's right? true. It gets overloaded. Speaking of singularity, what? The, this is the, yeah. There's one plot? The story singularity. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> right. And, and let me, I just want to say one thing, because Please. it's easy when we talk about being in relationship to, to really make it always primarily about relationship to other people. And of course, that is vital. It is also relationship to the natural world. It is also relationship to ideas, <laughs> to things, to, uh, you know, to, um, and to our own inner lives. And so, you know, I think it is also um uh when we when we think about relationality you know there are there are very different ways of being in relationship to the world and 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 some of that is inter interpersonal human relationships and there are many other relationships that we're engaged in um as creators i think so i think that's you know another important caveat in the Picture. You are relentlessly committed to uh, to identifying and staying in, in touch with the multiplicity. I love that, Sarah. Bravo. Yeah. You're um, not, not going to let the world get reduced and over. <clears throat> or us. We are all multiples. We're all multiple cells inside ourselves. We all are. So, so I, I commend famous you. poets say that we are multiples. <laughs> I contain multitudes. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I have in one version of my presentation, I have that image of, you know, it's like, this is true, but it's really hard at a cocktail party to introduce yourself as someone who contains multitudes. You know, people would really like to know, like, what does that add up to? Like, what am I going to hold on to here? You know, and so that is a partly why it's, it's nice to have a version of, of a version of multiplicity that is not chaos, but is pattern. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's what a constellation gives us. Ooh. That sounds like a good, good note to close on. We have gone well over our time. We, we may not have the hour tyranny, but we certainly have like the 90 minute tyranny, more or less. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a friendly dictatorship. So um, Todd and Esty, thank you for bringing Sarah to Rex, to our group. Uh, we really appreciate it a lot. <clears throat> it's been a great journey. Sarah, thank you for what you've invented and how you framed it and how you phrased it and how you've brought it in front of us. That's been, it's been really enlightening. And uh, I look forward to more and more conversations like this. So, so thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Thank you for having me and for the great questions and sharing and thinking together. And we can order your cards on the site, right? What are the resources? How can we get them? <laughs> <laughs> You could, except I'm in this gap between the old version and the new version. And so the new, so give me some time and I'll let you know through, you know, this, through Esty and Todd when the new cards are available. Because I'm not producing the old ones, the old deck anymore. Um, so I'm so, I, it's, a, it's not good timing in that respect. But, um, but I, you, know, if you want them sooner than later, happy, I can. I can provide you with a set of slides that do the same. Oh, cool. Just you're, in the, you're in the card Not as tangibly, yeah. So do we have her contact? Do we have Sarah's email, Jerry? Yes, it was copied on the invite, and I'll, uh, I'll continue doing that. Okay. Exactly. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, Jerry. Bye, Bo. <laughs> <laughs>